Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Visiting Speaker Series. I'm so glad you could all join us this afternoon. My name is Tamara Pesic, um, and our guests today are Bob Uderi and Greg, Greg Huang, who have written an amazing book about the folks over in Microsoft Research, Research's Asia Lab in Beijing. Um, through emails and through many personal conversations and through going over there and visiting them and hanging out with them, um, and rooting around in old papers uh, and getting folks to say much more than they really should have said. Uh, they've come up with just a fascinating uh, look at what goes on behind the scenes. Um, and I'm just so pleased that they could take the time during their book tour to come out and chat with us about it. So without further ado, please help me welcome Bob and Greg. Bill Gates made his first visit to China in 1994. He was not exactly well received. This translation from China Science Daily kind of set the, the tone. His first visit to China was very short. It was March 21st, 1994, when he was 39 to sell windows. He met Zhang Zemin. Zhang talked with Gates about Chinese civilization. Zhang said Gates should try to understand Chinese language and culture in order to be able to collaborate more. About a year later, Mr. Gates made a return trip to China. This time he seemed to be doing a little bit better. Zhang asked Gates where he would visit this time. Gates said, Western China, including Xi'an, terracotta warriors and horses, Three Gorges. Zhang said, Three Gorges is a good idea. He then recited several traditional poems about the Gorges. Zhang talked with Gates as if he was Gates's father. Zhang said, you're doing well. If you keep working hard, you'll succeed even more. Made three more visits in the next few years, uh, gradually building a, a good relationship with President Zhang. In early 2003, he went back for his fifth visit. And this time, after a brief talk about business, they really got into a very friendly discussion. Uh, and we would like to enact the scene from our book. <laughs> Which one should be Gates? <laughs> I think Bill, uh, Bill should be played by Bob because he makes much more money than me. <laughs> I can only hold these glasses for a little bit. They're Greg's glasses. I think we're going to pretend Bill has uh, contacts on today. So, why was Microsoft worth almost a trillion dollars? Well, the stock market was in a, a bubble. It was overvalued at the time. That makes sense, but a trillion dollars seems too much. Yes, it was too much. Uh, but the bubble, uh, it, now it's more reasonably priced. The stock was in a bubble. So why didn't you sell all the Microsoft shares? Well, to share, sell all the shares would be seen as not having confidence in the company. Besides, we didn't have that many shares. I guess I understand. This whole thing is not very rational. <laughs> you know, Mr. Zhang, you are a real capitalist. Here's your glasses back. <laughs> well, sorry to uh, start off that way. That's how our book opens, with some scenes, some snapshots of Bill Gates coming to China. Uh, the Chinese newspaper dubbed it, the headline was, The Mysterious Journey to China of the World's Richest Man. So we took that as the title of our prologue. Um, but we really thank Microsoft for being here. Uh, the story that we wrote um, about this Beijing research lab that went from non-existence in seven years to the top computer science draw in all of China, to making its presence felt in virtually every aspect of Microsoft's business, as I'm sure you know, and especially in the escalating wars with Nokia and wireless, 
and Sony and Entertainment, and of course, Google and Search. The way we did it is, uh, well, first of all, we couldn't have done it without a lot of cooperation from Microsoft. Uh, we came to, to Rick Rashid and Dan Ling about a year and a half ago with the idea, uh, and they gave us the green light, as did Harry Shum and Sheila Shang back in, in Beijing. But um, it's important to note that there was no deal here. There was no right of refusal. We didn't show them the manuscript beforehand. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't buy We don't have any Microsoft stock. And uh, we tried to reciprocate every meal we got on our own. And, and what we tried to do, though, was just dive in and tell the story of this lab, uh, not as a management treatise, but as on the grounds, from, through the eyes of the people involved, with their stumbles, their insights, their successes, and we hope that, um, that by doing it that way, that we can illuminate some important lessons in a, in a way that's maybe more fun and memorable than some management treatise. So we, we did it by, uh, we concentrated on a, a year that started with the sixth anniversary in November of 2004, and a series of events surrounding that in Beijing, and then uh, culminating a year later with the seventh anniversary. But we did a lot with the history as well. So we... We, uh, we partied with them, we played basketball with them, we went to demos, countless demos, and uh, sometimes they even forgot we were there, as Tam may have, have uh, hinted. It's like when a certain senior vice president of research on the bus ride to the Beijing airport proclaimed that Microsoft was going to win the Nobel Prize when it crushed Nokia, <laughs> because the, Sw the Swedes hate the Finns, you see. And... <laughs> So the idea for the book actually goes back to 2004. Bob and I were both at Technology Review at MIT, uh, owned by MIT. Um, I was senior writer, and, and Bob was editor-in-chief. And we had both heard a lot about this lab over in Beijing. And Bob had been following it for years. And I got interested in some of the technology they were doing. So we just got to talking, and Bob sent me over to China, which was a fantastic opportunity for me. I came back with a really interesting story. It turned into a cover story for the magazine and uh, actually two stories for the magazine. And then we got to talking about the book. It just made perfect sense for me that it was combining a bunch of interest in technology, global innovation, and, and connecting with the culture of China. Because my parents came from the mainland uh, by way of Taiwan, settled in Boston in the late 50s. So it was a chance to connect to the culture there. And you know, I, I still think that the main reason Bob wanted to work with me on this book is that he thought I could speak Chinese. <laughs> we could get along really well in, in Beijing. It wasn't until we got to the airport in Beijing, and I can't even help him find the bathroom, and <laughs> he realized what a big mistake that was. So, uh, if you could just. So, what is this word that's the title of our book, Guan Xi? Seems we joke that it's we chose it because it's nobody can pronounce it. So we are sort of the instant experts. But Wang Shi is composed of two, it's a Chinese word for the art of relationships and connections. It's composed of two characters. The one on top is Guan, which means gate or door. Bill no Gates? <laughs> Actually, it could be gates because there's no plural in, chi in Chinese. And the bottom one is Shi, or, which means to tie. It's kind of an interesting concept. So it's like tying relationships. A little bit mysterious sounding, but really it just boils down to four principles. And it's a lot of common sense has to do with trust, so respecting other people. Favor, sort of knowing when you owe somebody something. Uh, dependence, which is keeping things in harmony and reciprocating. And adaptation, which may be the most important thing of all, which is takes patience. And you have to cultivate these relationships. These are business relationships, personal relationships, intermingled. And it's not something you can rush. You can't, you can't rush it. You can't buy it. But most importantly, you have to have Guanxi in order to be successful in China, whether it's doing technology, you know, personal networking. Um, yeah. So what's the big deal about China? Why, do we, why does everyone need to be successful there? Well, if you read the headlines today, you might actually be missing the deeper story that we want to tell. Uh, and everything from you know, the Atlantic Monthly's cover story, which was a few months ago called How We Would Fight China, to a recent Time Magazine article called What China Really Thinks of the U.S. There's a sort of undercurrent of mistrust or distrust between the two countries. 
And I think that that, I mean, actually that, that as you can see from this cartoon, which goes back to the late 1800s, this sort of distrust uh, has gone back for a very long time. This, is, this goes back to the, the days of the ye yellow peril uh, in Europe and the US. But th the reality of the situation, which I think people are blinded by, by, by this sort of undercurrent of tension, is that any threat or crisis having to do with China can really be turned into an opportunity. And without trying to be, without being too corny, some of you may have heard this it's commonly said that in Chinese, the, the word for crisis, in fact, is composed of two characters, one of which is, signifies danger, or is associated with danger, the other one with opportunity. So there's kind of a balance there. I think it's really an accident, an accident of language. I don't think there's any deep Eastern uh, you know, thinking there. Sounds good, though. <laughs> but uh, the idea, OK, everyone's heard you know, the stats, yes, uproar over outsourcing. <coughs> Losing our competitive edge, um, you know, just the sheer numbers of China mean that it's very difficult to compete. But the flip side of this is this could be turned to competitive advantage by by companies, including Microsoft. And so again, so the bottom line, actually, I want to make with this slide is you've got to wake up. It's not that China is really is is a, about to awaken. It's already leading in some key some key technology and business areas. I think that's a really important point that. China is not a market to be spiraled into so much anymore. It's a place that's going to show the rest of the world in key areas what's happening. And it's, it's, uh, so it's not just a nice addition to the bottom line. It can be the future of the company, the future of renewal. And if you get it right in emerging countries like China, you can set the stage for growth for decades to come for your company. And we're just going to give you a little bit of historical context to show you how that, that is true. The little story begins uh, with a teenage guy named Bill from a rainy climate. He goes off to college, hits on an idea for a company, decides to drop out, convinces his dad to bankroll him, and within just a few years has created not just a highly successful company, but an entire industry. Well, this, this was 1856, and that Bill was a guy, an English chemist named William Perkin, and what he had done was invent the color purple. Why was this a big deal? Well, uh, one, if you have any uh, girls, you know that purple is a very big deal. But two, uh, colors had, had the same colors have been around for a couple centuries in Europe. They were very expensive. They were made from natural products, and only the upper classes could afford them. What Perkin had done was open the door for synthesizing new colors from organic compounds and held the potential to bring multitudes of different colors in an affordable way to the masses. But there were some problems. One, it was hit or miss to find a new color. So if you stumbled upon one, you, had, you went from rags to riches for a couple of years until that color fell out of favor. But then you were back on the streets unless you stumbled on to another one. To make matters worse, there was rampant piracy throughout Europe, where patent laws were just not enforced or strong. France was the worst culprit. And if we think about China as where we're going with this story, France of the 1860s and 1870s was a lot like China today. By the way, I just have to show you a picture of Bill Gates and William Perkins. They had a lot of similarities, but I guess Gates was more in trouble with the law. Well, uh, so France had a lot of similarities with China. It was source of cheap labor, disregard for intellectual property, rampant piracy, pretty good food. <laughs> it really took unified patent laws, strong patent laws, to open the door for industrial research. Germany led the way. Uh, once you uh, had a, a strong patent law, you had the incentive to invest in, in, in industrial research, take the guesswork out of finding new dyes, begin to really systematize the hunt for colors. And lo and behold, as you did that, you discovered that the same intermediate steps led to pharmaceuticals, heavy chemicals, photographic film, and the firms that pioneered this, uh, Hearst, BASF, and especially Bayer, are still powerhouses today from those initial inventions in the late 1800s. And in fact, the leader of Bayer, was a chemist who rose through the ranks to take over, 
become CEO. His name was Carl Deutschberg, and he also has a lot of similarities with Gates because he was a self-made man, a techie who rose to become an internationally known businessman. This is him on the cover of his bestseller, The Autobahn Ahead. <laughs> well, from there, the story moved to the United States, inspired by the European successes. Uh, General Electric started the first great research lab in the United States in a carriage barn uh, on the banks of the Erie Canal in Schenectady, New York. The idea uh, at the time, Thomas Edison's patents were running out. Uh, there was threats for new light bulb innovations from Europe. And the chief engineer, a man named Charles Steinmetz, himself a European immigre, said, we got to start a research lab to protect our position. And until, so Steinmetz, by the way, was a socialist. And until this lab, this became G's first research lab, he used this for his Saturday night poker game, the Society for the Adjustment of Differences in Salary. <laughs> Well, this became actually a tourist attraction. It became a syndicated radio show. The GE Lab exploded to the innovations in the first decade, not just in light bulbs, but in radio, appliances, and medical imaging that still form the core of GE's businesses, or several of them. And it kind of set the tone for how industrial research was uh, done for the next century, or for 80 years of the next century. So we're going to fast forward to the, to the current era, we know great labs were created at Bell Labs and IBM and, and DuPont. And, uh, but almost for 80 years, these were kind of university-like things, set up as kind of campuses, loosely connected to the business units. And of course, that all began to change with the rise of international competition. Uh, and you're now, as researchers, expected to be tightly attuned to the business units, to your customers, and sometimes even your competitors. And when Microsoft Research was formed in 1990, the, 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 leader, the, the management specifically eschewed the Xerox PARC model being down there near Stanford, far across the country from headquarters, put it right here on campus, close to Bill Gates' office. At the same time, research was becoming more and more internationalized in the 80s and 90s. IBM opened more labs abroad. Hewlett Packard opened labs in Japan and England. Siemens, NEC, Hitachi all came to Princeton, New Jersey. Microsoft itself in 1998 opened a lab in Cambridge, England. Every one of these had a common denominator. They were labs set up in developed markets, near developed uh, university systems that were world class. But then later in 1998, uh, to me as a, as a reporter and a writer, when Microsoft announced it was opening a lab in Beijing, this was very interesting. Everybody else was going to Japan if they went to Asia, or almost everybody else. Here's this lab being opened up in a place where the market is not yet mature, and the university system is at least several generations behind what we would call world-class universities. So what was happening there? That was very interesting. This is a good... This is the, the Microsoft Research Lab today. It's in its original space. Quite a contrast, the teeming Beijing to that carriage barn on the banks of the Erie Canal. It turns out the timing, 1998, really was perfect, perfect for Microsoft to get in there. So at that time, I mean, what US, US and Western companies saw in China was this huge potential market, which nobody had yet, almost nobody had really figured how to tap, and also cheap labor, you know, low-cost manufacturing. But what uh, Nathan Mirvold, the former uh, chief technology officer, uh, together with research executives Rick Rashid and Dan Lin, what they really saw, and they had the foresight to see that it's not really the market that's important here yet, it's the talent. And that's the long term. The long term payoff is going to be the talent. So Nathan Mirvold said to us the following We were hoping that if we could give Chinese computer scientists great research opportunities, we'd create one of the great research institutions in China, like the Bell Labs of China. So they were going for to be the best there. And to be the best, they had to recruit the best talent from all around China or from anywhere, the best in the world, and senior people, junior people. So to start off with, they had, they had to pick a director. And uh, so they picked a certain Kai Fu Li, who many of you are familiar with. Uh, Dr. Lee's background was as a, well, he was born in Taiwan, but was educated largely in the U.S., actually grew up 
as a kid in, in Tennessee. He doesn't have any trace of that accent. Uh, became a speech researcher, very well known in speech recognition at Carnegie Mellon. From there he went to Apple and Silicon Graphics, which is where he was plucked away by Microsoft to, to start this lab. And uh, one of the first things he had to decide, actually as sort of concurrent with picking him as the, the, the new managing, the founding managing director, there was really a debate that was raging at Microsoft Research. And that was, where are we going to put this lab in China? Should we put it in Beijing? Should we put it in Shanghai? So Beijing, you know, it's very academic and gov government. Uh, Shanghai, very commerce savvy, business savvy. So if you ask, if you ask Kai Fu back then why, you know, where, he, where he chose or why he chose what he did, he tells a funny story. He says, well, I, I, I talked to my mom, so this is Kai Fu's mom on the phone. I, I said, uh, I'm thinking of starting a lab either in Beijing or Shanghai. And his mom had, in fact, lived in both places. And uh, he said, well, Beijing is terrible weather, you know, sandstorms, cold. Shanghai is great weather, great food. If you guys go to Shanghai, I'm going to move in, move in with you. So, so, so Kai Fu told his wife, his wife said, okay, we're definitely moving to Beijing. So, but of course, the true reason was that I put it in Beijing was it's close, close to a few more of the really top research universities in China, especially in computer science, and close to government. So if you're going to be building relationships, which is really what this book is about, then you want to be close to government. You don't, you don't have anything to hide. So pretty much right away, the first order of business for Dr. Lee was to recruit the best talent he could from all, all around the country. This is a shot from uh, Tsinghua University uh, in Beijing of a event that they started pretty much right away the first year, maybe within a year of, of opening the lab, called the Conference on Computing in the 21st Century. And this is a huge extravaganza. Thousands of people would come, uh, lines out the door, that's Rick Rashid, Rick Rashid on stage, right. by the way. Rick Rashid up on, on stage giving a keynote address. People not just from Microsoft, but from outside, distinguished speakers brought in and it just drew huge crowds. We were fortunate to go along on one of these tours in Beijing and also in the southwest city of Chengdu. Uh, and outside of Chengdu, an interesting thing happened. We were, we were just waiting to get in, in, inside. It's a lot of bustling commotion, a lot of students trying to get in, but in fact, there, there's not enough tickets to get in. It, it was so full. So we were walking along, and a, a young uh, woman, female student, comes up to us and asks one of us, excuse me, are, are, you, are you Rick Rashid? Can you, can you get me into this event? What did you say, Greg? <laughs> so for the right price, you can do anything. <laughs> um, so but sort of jumping back in time now. First order of business, again, recruiting the top people from wherever. In fact, one of the earliest, sort of brightest stars who was recruited was named uh, Jin Li. And Li Jing is probably not here right now. He's actually a celebrity in China. This is so famous he can't be here today. But uh, <laughs> that's him as a kid, I don't know, maybe 10, 11 years old in the front, giving a computer demonstration at a Shanghai science fair back in 1984 to none other than Deng Xiaoping, the reform leader. Now, this was a poster that was part of a huge campaign. Tens of millions of people knew this picture. Why? Because, because Deng Xiaoping was saying computer education should begin with children. And this is the this youth like this is the future of China. And so Jun Li was a poster child for that. Tens of millions of people knew him by a nickname. The nickname was Deng Touched My Head. Now <laughs> it's not immediately obvious why it is, but it, apparently the story is that around this time, when Deng made that announcement about the future of China, he actually put his hand on, on Li Jing's head and said that. But unfortunately, it's not captured by the picture. Now, hand in hand with recruiting the young talent, one of the big challenges for foreign labs, especially, really any lab, but especially in China, you have all these young, young kids, but you need experienced mentors to, to really uh, work with them, mentor them in research. And so th this is a shot of what uh, we call the, the big three, and, and any of you know, know them. Uh, they're the core leadership of the lab, the core senior leadership. They all made their names here in the, in the U.S. before going back to Beijing. Uh, on the left is Yao Xin Zhang, who's uh, now the vice chair of Microsoft China, ran the, ran the Beijing lab 
for four years. Uh, among his <coughs> many achievements, he's, he was the youngest college student in all of China back in the 80s at the age of 12. Uh, he's the youngest IEEE fellow uh, in the history of that organization here in the U.S. Uh, also a pretty good karaoke singer from what I hear. <laughs> and uh, good dancer too. Uh, in the middle is Hong Zhang Zhang, no relation, but he's a multimedia and uh, information retrieval expert. He came from HP Labs. Funny story was when he was recruited to Microsoft to, to Beijing. He, he was really interested in going back to China to be closer to his mother and sort of touch the culture a little bit more. And, and he, for his interview, he, he landed in the Beijing airport. Uh, he, he didn't really want you know H, HP people to know he was interviewing, but. Uh, he got up, he, he turned out there was an HP colleague of his on the plane. So they got off the plane <laughs> together and, and they walk out into the airport and there's a Microsoft driver guy holding up a sign <laughs> saying, Microsoft, Hong Zhang. So, yeah, so that was a sign for him to join the company. <laughs> on the right, Harry Shum, most of you know. Uh, he's the current director. He's been the director since Justin uh, became promoted to the vice president. He's, uh, Harry is the, the, the current uh, director of the lab of Microsoft Research Asia, graphics guru. Uh, highly skilled in basketball, known for his one-handed uh, shots that earned him the nickname One-Handed Jordan on the courts of MIT of all places where he was, I guess, uh, working nearby for one summer. Uh, also Carnegie Mellon's dad. So, yeah, th really, these three are, are major characters in our book. And one thing we try to do is tell it from their point of view. So it's not a bunch of faceless Chinese guys working over there doing something, reporting back here. We actually show what they went through to get there. And I think, yeah. Well, one of the big issues that, that came up early on is, uh, as, you know, with these three stars, the big three recruited, it was like a magnet for talent. 10,000 resumes would arrive in a month uh, as students tried to line up jobs uh, for after they graduated. Uh, but one of the big, and, and Microsoft had almost its pick of the cream of the crop of Chinese computer science. But almost from the start, a big issue popped up, the culture and communications gap, that even though it, the lab was run by Chinese-speaking people, most of them born in China, hadn't quite anticipated. And so we don't really have a picture to show that. So this was the closest we could find of showing that cultural gap. You know, we call it, I said take out the Google guy, but you cut right, something like that. <laughs> so what happened was, you know, a Western management system met an Eastern university system. Uh, research, the re management was used to saying things directly. Researchers were used to kind of reading between the lines. What did that really mean? Uh, a researcher was prized to, in the Western system for his initiative, creativity, just taking the ball and running with it. The Chinese students were very used to following rote instructions. And this caused a big hurdle, a big stumbling block for both sides. And it caused actually a crisis in the lab. And it wasn't until management kind of accepted, hey, this problem is as much our problem as the students' problem, that things began to ease. And they set out goals much more clearly. They set specific milestones so that the researchers really knew what was expected of them. But even more so, um, uh, was the fact that it, it obviously took more time for even the best Chinese students to get with the system. So, so Microsoft created a new position, associate researcher, that was not found anywhere else in Microsoft. That basically said, you have two years to, to get it, and then we will hire you as researchers. So if you would have a PhD, you'd be the top student at Tsinghua University, but you wouldn't be hired as a research staff the way you would be if you'd come here. You were, said, you were told, you have two years to get it. Well, this is only a piece of the answer because what student would come with that kind of deal when you, they could be back out on the street in two years? Or maybe after one year, they're just wondering, am I going to make it, am I going to make it? And their productivity falls. Well, this is really shows the, the Guanxi side, the relationship building, the understanding of a culture that was so key. And Ya Chen Zhang actually had the idea that we have to do something, we have to find ways for everyone to win no matter what happens. And so his idea, and it took months and months of negotiations with the Ministry of Education, was, and it finally was granted, 
was for Microsoft to become the only foreign enterprise able to give postgraduate, uh, postdoctoral degrees in China. So the deal was, if you came for this two-year associate researcher, and even if you didn't make it, you got a postdoctoral degree. And in China, that postdoc is highly valued, much more prized than here. It's a guarantee of a, of a good job. And so this, this, this ability to solve the problem from everybody's point of view, this was really key to having the lab take off. And, and, uh, and as you know, as, since you work at Microsoft, Microsoft did. Uh, it's, it's developed starting with the user interfaces at Kaifu Li uh, and, and bringing in the, the graphics and multimedia of Ya Chin Zong or Harry Shum. It's expanded into these five core areas, wireless and search, and really increasingly uh, becoming a point, especially a person or a point group for Microsoft, especially in search. And if you look at some of the statistics, uh, it was part of what made us stand up and take notice. Um, you know, it was only supposed to be 100 people. Now it's 200 people. 2,000 interns have come through the lab, thousands of papers and hundreds of patents. You know, when I began to contemplate that nearly a tenth of all the SIGGRAPH papers came out of this one lab, or more than that, of the SIGIR, the information retrieval, the kind of base, basis of search, this, this is really interesting about what was happening. And this was part of why we wanted to jump on this story and and uh, and we think it really really shows a lot of, of you know how much care has gone into this. This wasn't just throwing money into China. And if there's a, if there's another main message in this book, it's that building Guanxi never ends. So you can be great, hugely successful, you know, tons of papers, lots of influence, getting your stuff in the products, selling great, um, but the actual building of relationships. It's got to continue. You've got to aggressively go after that at all levels of government, academics, other uh, you know, local software ecosystem in Beijing, throughout China. Uh, because you have to keep being humble, keep being sincere uh, in your dealings, and keep on trying to find ways for everyone to win. You can't just go and be happy with what you're doing and, uh, and then try to sell your products. Um, so in one of our chapters in the book, we actually take you behind the scenes for kind of an insider's view of how this relationship building actually takes place. So this is a really nice location. We are fortunate enough to be in on, on this meeting. It's uh, about 40 miles northwest of Beijing, a misty, cloudy day, the Great Wall of China. There's a portion of the wall that's called the Wild Wall. But most tourists don't get, get to this. It's overrun with vegetation and trees, very difficult to hike. It's almost all ruined. Actually, this is probably the most, the, the best preserved parts of it. There are parts that you cannot even walk on. Uh, at the foot of this hill, there's a ultra-modern architectural exhibit called the Commune by the Great Wall of China. Kind of, it's the, it's, it's one, that building there is one of 11 really interestingly designed buildings by internationally renowned architects from around, yeah, around Asia and Europe. And in May of 2005, there was a historic meeting that took place in this commune. It was between Microsoft and the Ministry of Education of China. And the authors of Guanxi. That's right. And what this meeting was about was, was to renew a collaboration between, between the two uh, called the Great Wall Plan. And what this was, it was a mostly an educational and training sort of a collaboration. It involved, it involved the Microsoft Beijing lab setting up additional fellowships and internships to train young students and young researchers. And it involved a new talent development center, which is just getting underway now in Beijing. And a renewed commitment to what, what are called software colleges in, in China, all around China. There are 35 of them. These are computer science departments that are focused more on the development side and not, not much on the theory. So Now, at this meeting, so what happened, it's sort of just being there firsthand, you learn a lot about the nuts and bolts of building these relationships. So the beginning, very formal, formal arrangements of seating. Sometimes sitting down to the meeting can take you know, five or ten minutes. The most senior people will decide where they sit. They typically would sit in the middle of the room, in the middle of the table, uh, and the more junior people would wait. And then the senior people introduce the junior people one by one, kind of formally. So it's kind of an interesting mix of very formal, but then later things get very informal. So. 
Uh, you know, so after the business is done, you have lots of uh, food and drink and uh, toasting of, of wine and, and beer and liquor. And so one of the one of the key lessons that, that I did not know before was the, was the rules of Chinese toasting. So the rules are that you always toast one to one. You don't toast the whole group. I would never toast all of you. You toast one to one, and then the person you're toasting, you should hold your glass lower than theirs to show respect to them. Unfortunately, Bob is not. So actually, things like this actually happen, where people people are uh, um, cheers. Cheers. People actually will keep going lower and lower until they hit the table or spill their drink. It's pretty funny. Um, and you can toast with empty empty glass as well. But so even then after that, there's there's plenty of time. Once the two groups get more comfortable with one another, they can even do things like play cards till two in the morning or um, do some karaoke. It turns out that karaoke was one of the. If you talk to Hong Zong, Zong, he would say it's one of the main reasons the lab got to where it is today. It's just, it's just being able to relax and do that kind of thing. Well, this agreement was set in uh, May of 2005. And I think it, it really shows, uh, again, what's happening not just in China, but in any emerging economy that's moving up. China is moving up the innovation ladder. It's not interested like it was before, just in capital or in low-cost manufacturing jobs. It's look, looking for access to the creation of knowledge. And when Microsoft or any company supports that, brings in interns, lets them go back out, supports the training of not just rote software development, but management practices, uh, it, it builds Guanxi with China. That's what China wants. And it's actually going to help everybody. So this was May 2005. All signs are great. Microsoft is growing like gangbusters, not just uh, the research lab, but also the advanced technology center, the development kind of arm. And then in July, Kai Fu Lee, who's back here as a vice president, announces he's going to Google in, a, in an unprecedented package worth about $10 million at the time, now closer to $15 million with the run-up in Google stock. Um, and, of course, it sparked a contentious lawsuit. Uh, Microsoft uh, sued to enforce the non-compete clause. It got pretty nasty in court. Uh, and as we do point out in the book, actually, Microsoft was far more professional in how it handled those court, uh, those court documents. But, but, but it was also kind of a validation of what had been going on with the Beijing lab. Because Kai Fu Lee, he emailed Eric Schmidt when he heard uh, Google kind of wanted to get into China on R&D. And it turned out he actually emailed Eric Schmidt with some documents about China the same day he emailed them to us. Uh, and, and we met him like, I had my last interview with him four days before he walked in and, and set this whole ball in, in motion. But he was being hired to do for Sergey and Larry what he'd done for Bill. And that is open not just a, a lab that would help it get into the market, but a lab that would help it tap this vast pool of talent that was China. He got to work. Um, he's, you know, the lawsuit was settled late last year. He's now in Beijing. He followed the exact same steps, basically, that he followed with, with the Microsoft lab. He located in Beijing, actually moved it closer to Tsinghua University than the Microsoft lab. Um, he uh, began touring the nation, drawing thousands of people, very much like the 21st computer. Uh, century in computing uh, tour. Um, he began trying to recruit senior leaders from the U.S., which he's not yet met. He's told me that he's, he's got some, but they haven't announced who they are yet. Guys like, you know, the equivalents of the, the Harry Shums or the Ya Chen Zongs who will come back and be mentors to the young students. He was planning only to hire 50 people. He's hired 100 so far in the first year. Thinks that'll do it. Um, they're being swamped with just like the MSRA story, 10,000 resumes coming in. You now have two formidable competitors for much the same talent pool. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you know, and as you know, Eric Schmidt actually uh, just went to China kind of doing what Bill Gates had done, his first Guanxi building tour just a few weeks ago uh, in which they announced the, the, the Google China. And... Uh, so we see this all playing out. Um, it's, it's great. It's great for everybody. We think that this, this is the validation of what's happening in the world, that this is 
good for China, it's good for Google, it's good for Microsoft because it's ramping up the innovation picture, it's taking it to different places of the world. And there's lots of room for everybody to win. And we think, uh, though, we think that Google, though, when it comes to Guanxi, is still, even with Kaifu Lee, quite a ways behind uh, Microsoft, which has been there since 1992 and has built up a lot of Guanxi. I think that when uh, President Hu came through town just a few weeks ago uh, and in co-commitment with that was this announcement that Lenovo and several other Chinese computer makers were going to pre-install legal copies of Windows on computers sold in China, that this was, you know, we can't prove it, but we think it's really uh, uh, the Guanxi building is starting to pay off. And you can see that uh, actually Bill Gates has learned much about Chinese culture and his glass is lower than President Hu's in the picture. So uh, it's an optimistic note on which we, we end. And, uh, uh, you know, there's lots. Of, we, we hope you uh, enjoy it. We hope you read the book to learn more. Uh, there's our website. We actually have the domain microsoftinchina.com. Thank you very much. I forgot to mention that if you, even if you don't study the principles, as long as you buy the book, you can tell your boss that you have Guanxi. So. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, open it up. Sure. I'm interested in the interrelationship between the Army Lab and the Army and Microsoft, etc. Incidentally, I, almost two years ago, I was in St. Petersburg, Russia. Running around. And there was obviously a Microsoft IT laboratory. And the son of my father died, who just finished his college work, was applying for a job at the IT center. Are the work on the projects that they take works on standalone projects, or are they integrated with what's happening here? Well, you know, it's a, it's a, yeah, sure. The question had to do really with uh, how are the projects chosen and being managed? Are they tied directly to business units back here? How, when a, a research project is developed, how is that tech transfer taking place, uh, you know, across this great uh, geographic divide and cultural divide, actually, too? And, and it's a complicated thing. I mean, as you work at Microsoft, you know that some research projects are pretty open-ended. Uh, there are a lot of initiative and not really plans or the, the researchers' <laughs> ideas of where things should go within a kind of targeted sphere. On the other hand, uh, increasing numbers of the projects are very targeted. Some are funded by the business units because it's work the business units want to see explored. And, and one of the great... Uh, successes of the lab. In fact, it, it became so successful with so many products needing to be transferred uh, into, uh, uh, I mean, so many research innovations needing to be tran transferred into products that it was becoming a bottleneck for the small groups of, de of developers and advanced developers there. And, and we actually have a whole chapter on the creation of what's called the Advanced Technology Center, uh, which has uh, now surpassed the Microsoft Research Lab in size, in size and it's in the same building now 300 people strong, uh, to, to really to, uh, to, to smooth that transfer. They're getting things ready for development, uh, you know, as they're being created almost, uh, so that they don't have to have that big lag time or if they arrive at the wrong point in the product development cycle or product developers have their hands full with just the normal stuff. So it's a, it's a complicated thing, and, and, and uh, uh, one of the brilliant pieces, uh, ideas behind this this uh, advanced technology center was that, hey, we've really found out how to tap PhD computer science students in China, but there's this whole sea of other kinds of talent in China, engineering talent, maybe people just with bachelor's degrees uh, that we haven't tapped with this research lab, and that advanced technology center is really doing that.
I couldn't help it. I'm sorry. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I mean, the, the, the recent deal, we're actually still trying to understand how significant <laughs> that is for the company. And it, uh, not really our business to tell you guys you know, how, how your company is doing on that, but I mean, I think it's a subtle, the negotiations have been subtle and um, long, on, kind of ongoing for quite a while. Um, and I'm sure, you know, Mr. Gates has been over there many times, once, once a year or so, um, trying, yeah, to, in the book. Um, the uh, the buying of software, absolutely. Government. You mean using it instead of say, open source? I think. Yeah. It absolutely is. It absolutely is part of the discussion, and it's a it's a careful thing that you have to talk about it without being kind of overbearing, kind of maybe even let them bring it up. So. Yeah, one of the deeper motivations in the lab, going back to Rick Rash and Nathan Mirvold, was that if you build up the software infrastructure in China, you're going to naturally build up the desire to protect uh, the intellectual property that's created in China. And, and I think that those are definitely factors that are coming to the fore now. I think I saw another, yeah. I'll just comment. A year ago, I had a We were having, when we were on the bus from uh, Chengdu Airport into the city, uh, it was late at night. We're driving through uh, this area of Chengdu uh, where there's this famous, big, huge electronics market. Most of it pirated software. Uh, I think it was Ya Chin as we were driving by. He says, I think they have Vista already. <laughs> <laughs> Another one? I mean, what I would say probably is that people like Kai Fu Lee and, and Yao Xin Zhang were often tapped, I think, for their insights into Chinese culture you know, by, the, by the top levels, at, top brass at Microsoft. So, um, you know, I think whenever possible, they, Mr. Gates and Mr. Ballmer would probably try to ask people. Uh, now, there is a, uh, a committee, right? It's called the China Redmond Advisory Board, which meets a few times a year. And, Craig Mundy is also a major participant in that, and he's been to China many times. So I think <coughs> over the last 10 years, certainly there's been a growing number of people who are becoming more and more comfortable with the culture there. And there are more, they have more people on the ground now than ever over there who can kind of give them a sense of the market and, and the culture. In the early days, there certainly wasn't. When we first got and we heard the story of Bill Gates' first uh, visit to China, but the word around the lab was that Bill Gates had shown up for the, uh, the meeting with the president of China in jeans. And, and just saying, and are you ready to meet the president? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we couldn't believe it. So we actually, we, we, it took us a while to track down the former uh, director, uh, president of Microsoft China, uh, who had gone on to a couple other jobs by then. And he was the guy who actually picked up Bill Gates at the airport. On It was his first day on the job, and his job was to pick up Bill Gates. And he said, well, Bill Gates did get off the plane in jeans, but he definitely went in a suit to, to meet the president of China. But the, the perception was that at the lab even, that Bill Gates had no real clue of the culture of China at the time, in 1994. Well, if there's no more questions, we'll go ahead um, and if you have uh, any sort of one-on-one -on -one questions that you'd like to ask Bob or Greg, they'll be fine. <coughs>